Any questions? Um, I would like to address uh, a question and a comment for David Howden. Uh, I really loved your presentation because I'm also very interested in shadow economics and I would like to ask you a question whether uh, you incorporated in your calculations the fact that Eurostat also incorporates in GDP calculations officially non-observed economy because I have a short story about Lithuania. I was very int was interested how they do that in Lithuania and I, w I went to the official statistics department and, and I asked this question and they say yes, Eurostat forces us to incorporate in GDP calculations the officially not observed economy. I tried to ask them about the methodology. They were really very vague about it. They couldn't explain me anything about it. And the fact is that they release the, the exact number only two years when nobody cares about it already. And I, after that, I, I wrote an article that sh shadow economy calculations is in shadow or something like that. So, and I also think that shadow economy in calculation in GDP is one way that the government can also manipulate official statistics. So could you comment, please, on that? Yeah, definitely. Um... Eurostat, when you go, when you actually look at the Eurostat uh, databases, they've got many different series of statistics. Uh, the one that I relied on was the harmonized uh, GDP calculation for the Eurozone. And in the harmonized figures, they don't include this, this figure. Um, but the funny thing is when you, compare the, when you compare the series that is supposed to include their estimation of the shadow economy with this one that I use, the harmonized one, there's really not much of a difference. So they do, they are trying to incorporate it on, on some series, but I think they've got uh, estimation problems. Any other questions? Professor Cantor, I, thank you, thank you. Uh, Sean Gabb. Pr Professor Cantor, I, I greatly enjoyed y your lecture, and I'll call it a lecture, not a speech, because, um, it was a lecture. Uh, I, I was particularly struck by your, um, by your explanation of how novels are usually written. Um, wh when I was younger, I was often rather intimidated by the thought that other novelists had clearly thought out everything in their books before um, switching on their computer or setting pen to paper, and, and that the writing process was largely a, a process of faithfully translating the content to their mind um, o o onto paper. Whereas my own experience has been that uh, writing is a fundamentally chaotic process and quite often you have no idea what you're going to write when you sit down and when you finish writing you, you, you are surprised by what you've done and often annoyed because it means you then have to go back and rewrite what you've already written. Indeed, if I could work a commercial plug into my question, <laughs> um, this particular masterpiece, uh, I was halfway through it before I realized what the plot was. And the reason I didn't know what the plot was was because I didn't know one of the characters sufficiently well. It, it's, only when I, I, it's only when I really thought about this character that a light came on in my mind and I was able to finish it. And I've spoken to many other writers, and my experience is by no means singular. Indeed, I'm wondering how many, or, or, how many writers whose works are, in the formal sense, perfect, are, are just as chaotic and disorderly uh, as I am, but um, are simply better able at tidying up the end results. Uh, I think you're right. I mean, one of the things I discovered as I check more and more cases is writing as chaos. Uh, that's why it's a form of spontaneous order. And it's actually very rare to find authors who truly plan things out fully ahead of time. And it, it's one of our great myths that, and again, I, I use the example of music, but you, you see it again in Amadeus. You know, Mozart has it all in his head, and all he has to do is write it down on paper. And the implication is that the writing it down doesn't contribute to the work. It's, and in fact, and, and you know, the famous thing about Mozart's clean manuscripts, I gather scholars have been checking the manuscripts more, and there's lots of corrections. Uh, and famously, Beethoven's manuscripts are almost indecipherable because of the amount of corrections. So indeed, um, 
uh, I would say that artistic creation is a process and it's better for being a process. Percy Shelley has an incredible claim in his defense of poetry. Uh, when composition begins, inspiration is already on the decline. I think that's precisely wrong. That is exactly the idea that you had this perfect vision and uh, uh, the problem is you had to take some time to work it out. I was talking to someone about Coleridge in the break and the famous example there is Kublai Khan that he had this, he had the poem in his head and then someone interrupted him when he was writing it down and so it's not as good as it could have been. But um, the more I look at it, uh, in one way or another, uh, the process actually improves the work of art as it, you know, as it does anywhere in the economy. Things are not just done all at once, and if you're not willing to correct yourself, you're probably missing something. Any other questions? <laughs> I have a question for uh, Professor Cantor as well, which is that uh, it could be that the state on purpose insulates artists from the, uh, the commanding uh, consumers uh, to foster a style of writing and composition that will encourage them to think along the lines of central planning and how easy it is and how great it is to propagate that attitude uh, in the population. But my question is, is, is that really true? And uh, Supposing we have a private law society and there's no such thing as government funding of the arts at all, would we see any kind of benefit in, in terms of a whole bunch of works of art now being subject to the whims of the market and therefore uh, void, devoid of uh, an, uh, a tolerance or a uh, approval of central planning? Well, as I said, there is this problem that the, for many artists, the process of artistic creation puts them in a frame of mind that makes them think everything should be directed. And uh, again, I try to understand why artists are, uh, have been so anti-capitalist. But um, to go back to your initial statement, uh, I wouldn't give the people involved in government support of art uh, enough credit to think they might have thought through what you said. Nevertheless, it clearly is an example of creating another dependent clientele in the population, and uh, there are an awful lot of uh, artists today in all walks of life who uh, think in terms of government grants. What that, what that means now is political correctness. If you want to get a government grant, you need to be political correct politically correct in all sorts of ways. You can almost check the boxes. And in that sense, I think government support of art does encourage uh, and reward certain attitudes, and that's not a good idea. Uh, and yet, you know, I believe we should have no government support of the arts. Uh, uh, but it's interesting. I, I think that uh, aristocratic patronage of the arts was great, and in fact, is tied in with many of the greatest works of art. Produced because aristocrats had taste and made individual decisions. That's what I want to see what, what kills contemporary uh, government support of the arts is bureaucracy. I've sat on the National Council on the Humanities of the United States, which supports humanities scholarship, not works of art, but I could see the process there, uh, that it was deeply irrational because it was bureaucratic. And for example, there was this impulse to equalize grants among the 50 states as if talent is evenly distributed among the 50 states in the United States, shielding on the grounds of population. That isn't true. Uh, so I think modern support of the arts is bureaucratic and the only truly irrational form of support of arts, uh, uh, the, the Catholic Church did a great job supporting arts in the Renaissance and the Baroque period. Uh, all these aristocrats and monarchs did. Uh, so, and, and the, uh, the, the one aspect of, of it that uh, is truly pernicious, is, it is based on the premise that commercial art is necessarily corrupt. 
and that we have to shield artists from the pressure of the market. That ha uh, Now, again, I, I love in, uh, 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 Schoenberg and Bartok and uh, Samuel Beckett and James Joyce and you know, many modernist artists uh, whose obscurity was justified by a genuine vision. But the result of having art now sponsored by universities, foundations, and government granting agencies is any jerk can call something a work of art, and if he gets a government grant, uh, he can produce it with no accountability whatsoever. And in fact, these, uh, these artists I mentioned, I mean, they struggled uh, uh, to prove themselves. Uh, and in that sense, you could see they really did have talent. They are great uh, artists. But now we've got a, a world of government-subsidized mediocrity in art. It's exactly what you would expect from government subsidies. When I, uh, this is for Paul. Uh, when I saw the title of your presentation on t uh, using literature to teach economics, I was particularly drawn to uh, the kind of literature that I think used to be much better in helping children learn both about uh, the world in a social setting and also in an economic setting. I'm reminded of uh, Bruno Bettelheim's classic work on the uses of enchantment that were designed to help children see the, the contrast between pure white good, pure black evil, so to speak, not with the sense of trying to pre present these conditions as the way the world is, but as a way of allowing the, the children to discriminate on the basis of, of, of some standards. And that also carried over into uh, such economic-based literature as uh, I, what I think is the most powerful uh, piece of children's literature for teaching economics, and that's the story of the little red hen, which has been butchered, slaughtered, <laughs> turned into everything, the welfare state uh, character, uh, you know, all of the attributes of market activities you know, swept away. And I, I, I think of this in terms of the importance of, of helping these attitudes develop within children, about, I think that the, maybe the first two or three years of their lives are the most important, important years. You know, by the time they grow up and go to college and so forth, they've been pretty well imbued with a lot of other socialist doctrine. I guess I'm asking what your, uh, how your presentation or what your, some of your thinking might be with regard to uh, providing for a healthier form of children's literature? Well, it's, I have to confess I don't know too much about children's literature, but I see what you're saying and I agree with it, that uh, traditional children's stories taught a lot of genuine virtues like saving and the virtue of hard work and so on, and that really has been lost in the contemporary use of stories in schools, and I'd like to see a, a return to that. Now, my uh, I, I don't have as good taste as you do, so my taste r runs to cartoons, and I write about The Simpsons and South Park. But there, too, it's very interesting to see how uh, those stories of, uh, can illustrate some real economic truths. I write about uh, South Park in my, my new book, The Invisible Hand in Popular Culture, University of Kentucky Press. Uh, but uh, the, the uh, uh, South Park teaches incredible libertarian lessons. Uh, it attacks political correctness. It, uh, uh, it defends corporations. Uh, it, it makes fun of Hollywood celebrities who pursue environmental causes and so on. So I, I confess to knowing more about that than, than children's literature. Uh, uh, but I do, I, I, it's very important the stories that our children learn and those stories do embody 
a set of values, and very often an understanding of economic life, and they're getting a very wrong view of the world in many of the stories that are now showed. Again, so many of the stories that are now taught to children are there to teach them toleration and political correctness, uh, and uh, in some ways contribute to you know, the dependency of a whole population when the children are taught, taught these lessons. So it's not something we should ignore, indeed. But my route is to try to get to the, to the children at the lowest possible level where I live. Uh. Hi, uh, my question is also for uh, Dr. Paul Cantor. Uh, because uh, w when you cited uh, the example, you know, from the English-speaking world, yeah. well, particularly uh, Dickens, uh, it also reminds me uh, one of the considered one of the greatest Chinese uh, novelists uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, in the 60s, around the 60s, uh, he uh, founded his own newspaper, and to to push uh, the 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 sales, he write his own uh, novel every day in a column. So and it must be under some pressure and feedback. From the from the uh, reader, and then and now he, he is considered to be one of the greatest uh, novelists uh, in modern Chinese history. So I'm, what I'm trying to ask is that uh, have you ever come across you know actually what you observe is like a creation under without you know centrally planning that kind of manner? Is it a cross culture thing or? Yeah. Well, as far as I can tell, it is. But uh, you know, I do not know Chinese literature, and I do not know Chinese. So, uh, but uh, you uh, you can observe it in other cultures and in places that you don't expect it. There is a. Uh, I don't know if I want to get too deeply into the question of the authorship of the Iliad and the Odyssey, but there's a great, as some of you may know, there's a great question whether there was a Homer and whether one individual human being composed these two poems. And in fact, there's a very uh, interesting theory developed by a professor at Harvard named uh, Gregory Nagy that shows how the Iliad and the Odyssey came into existence over time in a process of bards who were singing portions of the poem around the Greek-speaking world and how they came together at festivals. and uh, In effect, the poems evolved out of the cooperation uh, among uh, different poets. And I found that quite striking. Uh, so yes, as far as I can tell, these principles, uh, there, there's nothing specific to one culture that would dictate that this is how uh, it would only, this process would only take place, say, within in Europe. You see it, uh, and again, the the uh, when you I bring up Homer because when you study the great epic poems uh, from around the world, whether it's in Sanskrit or Sumerian, uh, they all seem now to they're products of oral traditions and therefore of a process and not a single act of creation. I think the reason why we're asking you all the questions is because uh, we've maybe thought about what you're saying a little bit less than the other topics. But um, my question is, basically, I've always found it hard to apply things like objective truths and things from economics as to things like the arts as you've explained, and we talked about, you know, me preferring Coleridge, you preferring Shakespeare. I prefer maybe Chopin to Mozart, maybe you, you're the opposite. To what extent can you apply an objective standard in that view, in your opinion? Um, well, you know, that's an entirely separate uh, question from what I was talking about. I, I never said anything about how art, how economics could explain whether a work of art is good or not, and I don't think it can. I think, I believe there are aesthetic criteria and that we can argue about the quality of a work uh, 
what complicates it is sometimes we're all arguing about formal properties, sometimes we're arguing about content, and that's one reason there are so many disputes. Uh, uh, and I would say those arguments should take place within the aesthetic realm in the sense that uh, you're really asking questions that have to do with the specific to the art. So that, for example, I would never say that a novel that supports capitalism is necessarily good and a novel that supports socialism is necessarily bad, though I might have some inclinations uh, in that direction. So nothing in what I said had to do with the issue of economics somehow now providing us with objective criteria for judging works of art. What I was saying is that economics uh, does help us understand why, in fact, great works of art can be produced in commercial settings contrary to what so many people have claimed. Uh, I'm, I, I'm getting my criteria of greatness independent of the issue of economics, uh, but I want to say, gr given the fact that we judge Shakespeare to be great, or Dickens to be great, or Coleridge to be great, is there some way in which we can see that there uh, achievement was not uh, contrary uh, to the commercial setting uh, of their work. I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm always intrigued. I, I got a quote out of a Chicago newspaper uh, uh, from Janet McTeer, who's a fairly well-known British actress, and, and she was complaining about, she was saying why she'd never make a Hollywood movie and why she hated commercial theater, and, and she says, with no sense of irony, if Shakespeare had had to write for a commercial theater, he never would have produced the plays he did. I mean, what ignorance. He was the most successful commercial dramatist of his day, the only one to get a percentage of the gross on his plays. He ended up, in effect, a millionaire of what he made on his plays. So anyway, that, that's all I'm claiming. The, 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 the issue of the objectivity of aesthetic criteria, I, they aren't, I, I mean, I would say I don't think they're objective. I still think one can have a rational discussion. I might possibly be able to persuade you that Shakespeare is greater than Coleridge by, for example, citing Coleridge's opinion on the same subject. <laughs> Um, I did want, want to ask uh, Dr. Cantor about state censorship of the arts, but I won't because somebody else needs to answer a question. Okay. So um, could I ask uh, Thorsten about his um, optimism of uh, a world fiat currency not coming into being uh, because people revolt and, and look at the current trend on tax, tax havens, the G20 initiatives where on many things you'd think the G20 couldn't agree on anything. Um, and countries used to compete on, on tax uh, much more than it looks like they're going to in the future. So you're already beginning to see on the tax front money laundering uh, laws, etc., etc. that there are now more and more um, globally supported uh, functions in which governments are teaming up. And there doesn't seem to be any revolt against any of these actions anywhere. So um, I'm just asking you where you get your optimism from that it won't happen. No, thanks very much uh, for uh, finding this, um, this optimistic shade in my talk. Um, appreciate. Um, see, you know, what, what I tried to do was uh, to come up with uh, a pure theoretical uh, delineation, you know, based on praxeology. And um, your question really refers to uh, a prediction uh, into the future, which, which is actually to some extent beyond what, what theory can provide. Um, let me maybe reiterate what I, what I try to say. Uh, clearly, the starting point of my talk was the state, the origin and nature of the state, and from that uh, I developed the conclusion that st states, nation states start uh, cooperating in order to, you know, to bring about closer monetary cooperation, and this process would then lead towards 
single fiat currency system. And uh, I, I wouldn't deny that such a development is underway, and you gave some further examples where governments increasingly cooperate, be it tax issues, be it uh, taxations, regulation. And uh, the, the point I try to make is, of course, uh, this cooperation might continue for quite some time, but um, I would doubt that the, the ultimate end is achievable, namely to have a centralized uh, central bank issuing a single world fiat currency. And the point I made was the initiative to set up uh, a fiat money system might be successful for quite some time, just driven by small group interests. But sooner or later, I would, I would assume that the need for, uh, for world government will appear on the horizon. And the point I made then was to say, if, 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 if a democ democratic world government is envisioned, then it would run into insurmountable problems. And my, my point was, you ha would have to impose a de democratic rule over an ethno-culturally heterogeneous, most heterogeneous territory. So at some point, I, I would assume, and, and of course this goes a bit beyond the theoretical thinking, um, it, it is going to break down. At some point, the whole plan has to be abandoned. And this is a, well, I, I'm, I'm, and I, again, I appreciate that you say this is optimistic. <laughs> If I may add, uh, I think there is a difference between the creation of one world central bank and tax uh, harmonization. And the difference is that in case of tax harmonization, uh, various states, well, they are not giving up their powers. They are merely harmonizing what is already happening. Whereas in the case of creation of one world central bank, some uh, pretty big amount of power will be given away, and now you get the question, how do you divide that power in the new institution? And in case of European Central Bank, you can see that, so you can envision how many problems you would see in, in case of one world central bank. My question goes to Thorsten Pollard as well. Uh, you said uh, that a central world government is going to break down at some point. Uh, I wonder if there's any uh, point before breaking down all the world uh, to stop that uh, development. Because as, you've, as we have seen with the Euro, it is very well possible uh, to, uh, to create the Euro with a formatically uh, democratic regime, and uh, it has worked for certain years now. And let's see how long it will continue to work. So the question is, uh, you can't rely on, on the cultural and eth ethnic uh, diversity to prevent world government. Yeah, I see, um, you know, I'm, uh, I clearly uh, see that uh, you're getting increasingly haunted by this idea of uh, a world government uh, being upon you. Um, you know, the, I also referred in my, in my talk to the, to the Euro project, and um, typically it is marketed as a, as a kind of crowning step in the political and economic integration in Europe. If, and if you apply a practical analysis, I just try to outline it, then uh, it, you, you, would, you would actually see a different story behind this, this whole project. It is, a, is an, it is clearly an attempt to um, reduce uh, the competition among national fiat currencies, um, substituting national governments for a single centralized, manage, centralized uh, currency managed by a centralized central bank system. Um, as, as you already pointed out, I mean, the, the problems become increasingly clear. I mean, we, we know that fiat currencies cause a lot of damage, economic damage to, uh, you know, for instance, the, the current financial and economic crisis is at its core a crisis of the fiat currency system. Uh, now, the damage has been done, and in Europe, nation states keep struggling who's going to shoulder the costs. Uh, so far, they have applied some tricks, you know, like the European stability mechanism uh, for 
you know, to, to prevent the public at large from seeing the costs. So you could, you could argue, I mean, that even the, the, the political uh, proponents of the single uh, currency project run into quite some problems to hide the negative effects of the single currency. And I, I, would, I would think that these, these problems keep building up. Um, maybe we are just at the be very beginning of this whole crisis. And so I would say it's premature from, let's say, uh, the experiments of the last 10 years to conclude that because of the last 10 years, uh, it is likely that these political initiatives will be successful in, in, in moving forwards. Maybe just a comment also on this. Uh, to some extent, maybe we don't need the premise that we need the world government to get monetary unification. As a matter of fact, that's what we have in the US. There is a single dollar, but still the taxing authority uh, uh, at state level is distributed. In the European Union, we have the same, so to speak. Single monetary policy, but still uh, taxation is kept as a national uh, priority. So maybe we can also imagine more subtle ways of monetary unification within this praxeological approach which you developed, with which I fully agree, that there will be a single currency where governments will give up uh, this monopoly of uh, monetary creation, so to speak, but other functions of government will be kept. That, that might quite well, I believe, also be uh, uh, one outcome which would reconcile these concerns. Uh, if I may also, I don't know how to phrase this as a question to Matt, um, I fully agree with your comparison between Keynes and uh, Friedman, but wouldn't you go a little bit further and say that actually Friedman uh, is much worse than, than Keynes in a sense? Um, because he never uh, published a full treaty on money. Uh, he has contributed, uh, he is the monetary theorist of the 20th century, he contributed to this complete disintegration of monetary theory, so to speak, where uh, uh, macroeconomics has become only a matter of uh, specific tools, uh, gaps, uh, which particular um, econometric uh, technique to apply. And when you combine this with uh, his uh, uh, free market defense uh, on other areas, uh, the picture which he uh, helps to convey of a free market view on money is uh, actually a complete disaster. Uh, what would you be your take on this? Well, I would say that that's the spirit of his times, uh, the way the science developed. And uh, maybe it's because he was more, in his methodology, he was more positivistic than, than Keynes. But using that standard, we, we should even say that Marx is better than, than Friedman, right? Because at least he wrote the treatise, right? We're a big one, three volumes. Uh, but I, I would say it's just the spirit of, of his times, the way the science developed. Uh, do we have any treatise after 45, 1945 written by any uh, good, very good mainstream economist we have? Oh, yeah, and that's the textbook even, right? So it's, it's, you don't have many footnotes and so on, right? And Patinkin maybe, right, right. You know, I, I wouldn't come to the, wouldn't want to come to the rescue of Milton Friedman, but uh, maybe there's one consideration which we, which we, um, which we should uh, take into account. Um, when Friedman came up with his monetary rule that was, as you say, in a, in, a, in a period where inflation was high, and the idea was how do we get inflation, how do we get a lower rate of inflation, and Friedman's idea was, okay, we, we keep the money production monopoly with the central bank, but impose the central bank under a strict constitutional rule. So the central bank has no scope for discretionary action. And lobbying groups cannot interfere with monetary policy making. That was his idea. And in fact, Friedman said he tried to mimic a kind of gold standard by this, uh, by this monetary framework. Because at that time, he knew in the 1950s, 1960s, he wouldn't get any sympathy for you know, returning the world monetary system onto a gold standard. And so Hayek at that time was for free competition of currencies. He just said, you know, let, let the market decide what kind of currency people would like to have. And the response of Friedman was, uh, in, in this case, Friedman was actually more 
stayed skeptical than Hayek. Friedman said, once we admit, allow for currency competition, sooner or later the government will step in and issue its own money. And therefore, we've, we are going to have a better situation to have a clear-cut framework within governmental power over the money production is actually put to a limit. Um, but of course, Friedman was in complete denial. I think that was the biggest problem uh, of the Austrian School of Economics monetary theory because Friedman suggested that under his monetary framework, money should get uh, created through bank circulation credit. And, and that gives, of course, all these boom and bust cycles, speculation, speculative bubbles. I think there is the, the really big mistake, so to speak, Friedman did. Um, so we have 10 more minutes um, and four people on the list just to give your orientation. Uh, talking about uh, the possibility of a fiat currency, a one world fiat currency, um, and that it may disintegrate for whatever reason or eventually occur and then uh, eventually collapse given that uh, no fiat currency can uh, exist forever. I'd like to know sort of each of your thoughts, perhaps given the small time frame, maybe just a, a, a quick response, but uh, regarding whether we'll return to some sort of commodity money, and if so, which, will, which it will be if you see silver and gold coins uh, in, in the future uh, or something else. You know, one, one lesson I learned during the international financial and economic crisis is that the system is much more robust than most people think it is. And the reason is there's so many people depending on fiat currencies. You know, we have so many people receiving government transfer payments, uh, receiving their job opportunities from the state. Uh, people have invested a decent amount of their lifetime savings in fiat denominated bonds issued by banks and, 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 and governments. And so we have actually a strong incentive among, I would say, the majority in most of the people in most countries to keep the system going. And the only, the only uh, way to bring down to its knees a fiat currency system is a collapse of the money demand. So people would no longer wish to hold the money newly created by the central bank, and we are far from such a situation, I, I assume. So uh, it, 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 I would say it's, it's, it, it's going to continue for a while, <laughs> but the econo underlying economic damage, of course, uh, increases, uh, the, the, that's for sure. And uh, in, in terms of timing, I, I have no idea, I have no idea. But I would assume that it makes a tremendous sense to, you know, to invest your lifetime savings wisely, you know, don't put your money in the bank, <laughs> don't buy bank bonds, because sooner or later, for instance, in your area, some of these bonds will be cancelled out, then they are gone, <laughs> some, of, some government's bonds, government bonds uh, will meet the same fate, and there will be money printing, there will be taxation, and, and the best thing you could do is really to go under the radar screen of the government. I think this is maybe the best uh, recommendation I can give in terms of structuring your lifetime savings. I think there are two ways. Oh, sorry. You, okay. I'll pass. Well, I'm the socialist on the panel, so I was told, so keep that in mind with this answer, but I don't actually think we're facing uh, monetary disintegration because despite what you might think, uh, politicians and central bankers aren't exactly idiots and they know a good deal when they have it and they're not going to let the system go to waste. In fact, there's, there's relatively few uh, historical instances of hyperinflation wasting away a currency when you think about it. And I'm really not too worried, uh, or I, I assign it fairly low probability that central bankers today are going to completely destroy their currencies and then also give up control of the currencies that they have uh, to the free market because they realize the, the, the power that's bestowed in them 
uh, and the profits that are bestowed in them, rather, uh, by controlling them. I, I would agree with this, but we have also to keep in mind that uh, what we are observing here due to mass business cycles is a general impoverishment of society. And when you couple this with uh, the welfare states here and the, uh, the, the entire uh, classes of the population which are living uh, on government money, of government money, it is quite clear that at some point we cannot fully avoid hyperinflation as a natural result not as created by governments. And that is probably the cost affection that will uh, happen in the future. Indeed, we don't have monetary disintegration now. Uh, uh, we have actually uh, precisely monetary unification, as Thorsten uh, pointed out. Latvia has joined the euro, so against all expectations that the eurozone will be divided, it is actually expanding. There are plans for another monetary unions here and there in the world currently going on. So we will go on, on that way, I believe. There will be more moral hazard, as Austrian economics explain, a decrease in productivity, uh, higher demands for, from uh, population on welfare, uh, and then this can only be uh, provided through future inflation. Okay, we have... Um, yeah. When I was a young man, a boy, actually, uh, the wall came down, the Berlin Wall came down all of a sudden, November 1989. And I was uh, brought up in school and people were saying, you know, it may take decades for the wall to come down. And as a young boy, I believed what I heard. And it took me by surprise, I was uh, in Portugal at that time, seeing in a little coffee shop uh, TV showing, you know, people streaming, you know, across the border with, with people, you know, hammering down the wall. And um, all I'm saying is uh, socialist projects um, won't be successful. And our monetary system is a socialist plant economic system. And so you should always reckon with a certain surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was an external world, right? You need an external world. In case of socialism, you had an external world. In, in case of fiat money, you don't have that external world. Right? So if, if you would have like one word socialism, like in Orwell's, then the collapse wouldn't be, well, would be less probable, much less probable. Okay, we have now two more minutes. Maybe just one more question. Um, I have a question for Professor Howden. Um, one of the big issues among Icelanders is whether or not it would be good for the Icelandic um, economy to be part of the European Union. So what are your thoughts? Well, being part of the EU or being part of the Eurozone didn't save too many other countries from being in a crisis. So if they think that this is going to be the panacea for their, for their woes and that uh, Euro inclusion would somehow keep them out from having this, this uh, giant boom that they had, I think that's a mistaken belief. Uh, and I'm not so sure that, that's on the Eurozone side of things, I'm not so sure that joining um, the European Union and subjecting themselves uh, to the laws and legislations of it is such a, is such a good move either because there's a lot of Iceland is a country rich in natural resources in many ways. It has, it has many opportunities to get itself out of this crisis. It's done a lot of it already. Um, but subjecting yourself to the whims of the EU that has a, a different agenda or uh, different uses for your resources and your wealth, I don't think is such a great, great idea. And I, I think that this is more pushed by the ideas that Iceland would join the Eurozone uh, or the EU. I think that there's motives more within the EU or the Eurozone to get that rather than your average Icelander demanding this. Okay, sure. A lot of just normal, ordinary Icelanders, they foolishly, in my opinion, believe that it would be good for the economy to join the Union um, because it would enhance free trade. So that's just what the ordinary Icelander believe, the ones that support the idea. They're already in the economic union, so they already have perfectly free trade with Europe. 
that wouldn't that wouldn't change if they joined the EU. They would just subject themselves to the laws. There's no benefit in that. They're mistaken if they believe this. Okay, yeah, the very like, last like question. Like Turkey in that regard. Very last question, Mr. Schwarzer. No, it's, uh, oh, really? oh, okay. No, uh, uh, that's it, sorry. Time. <laughs>